last time. But for those in quarantine, I don't know if it's any help or not. I appreciate the notes. The notes I'm sure are useful for the students who are here. Um, I don't have today's assignment up yet. But I'll try to get it up right after this class. It's going to be dealing with today's topic interfacing switches and LEDs to microcontrollers. I'm guessing you've talked about that in 254, but we'll review it. And then on, mon on Monday, I think the next section is an introduction to C. We've already done a little bit of C programming, but it talks specifically about um, programming the microcontroller that we're going to use. So I may send out an email if I can find a good set of instructions. Um, I'll send out an email that says you'll need to install the software on your on your laptop. Um, it's uh, it's a different developer environment and a set of cross compilation tools so that we can write software on our on our laptops to then program the microcontroller that we're going to use. So it shouldn't take long to install the software, but then that way. You know, Monday or Wednesday, we'll actually start working with the microcontroller. So if you haven't been bringing those to class, start doing so. Um, again, I can try to, um, we can try and store them in the closet if you want to leave them here. Um, you know, on some of the projects, you'll need to take them out of the classroom. They're actually pretty inexpensive. We I'll have to check around, we might have enough um, that we, you could leave one in, in the class here and then take one with you or something. But, I'm not sure if we have enough for you to do that. So, are there any questions? Looked at a lot of different, you know, kind of some stuff in C last time, trying to show, you know, the relationship between <coughs> how negative numbers are stored, how positive numbers are stored, you know, and all the different data types of char is kind of unfortunate because it really is an 8 bit data type, integer data type. It's typically used to store character data, but um, it, it's really, and it can be used to store character data, but it, but it really isn't an 8-bit numerical data type. Um, switches, that's not useful, switches, switches and LEDs. Um, so for microcontrollers and uh, embedded systems we build, you, you typically don't have like a keyboard for input. Sometimes there might be, you know, like a numeric pad, but even that's rather unusual. Typically on most of our embedded systems, you know, there, there are switches for inputs. Those may, might be level switches to sense the level or something, or, or bump switches or limit switches. Um, you know, uh, more sophisticated robotic systems, there, there can be sensors that determine how far away something is. Uh, line following sensors, you guys have probably played with some robots that have done line following in the past. Um, but basically, and in more sophisticated applications, we've got analog to digital converters. You know, if you want to take, take the temperature, the output of some sort of temperature sensor and convert it into a number and do some sort of processing or pressure sensors. But um, um, those, the most basic type of input is a digital input. You know, it's a high or low, often produced by just a simple switch. Um, with our microcontrollers, we often don't have, you know, any sort of output display or terminal. You know, sometimes we do, and that's becoming maybe a little more common to have some sort of LCD display for you know, simple output. Um, but, you know, we don't have often for our embedded systems, you know, a full monitor that displays things and, and graphics and things like that. But our, our, our most basic output is just a simple light, an LED, you know, where we turn on or off to indicate, you know, this uh, status and something. So that's what we're going to talk about today, how, how to hook these up to microcontrollers. So uh, switches, there are a ton of different 
styles of switch. You can have you know the, the toggle switch, a push button switch, you know rotary switches, rocker arm switches. I'm sure tens of others. Um, you know on the on what's common on the printed circuit board or what we call the dip switches, the dual inline package switches. There's typically eight of those little slider switches. That's the slide switches. That's another type. The other thing that you'll run into are uh, classification. What are called the, the single pole, single throw, and this is what will what we will work with almost exclusively. Exclusively, you know, this might be shown like this. So on on the single pole, single throw switch, there's two connectors to the switch. Um, with the switch in. Um, one position, as I've shown it, the, the, the two connectors would be disconnected. There would be an open circuit between them. With the toggle thrown or, or the button pressed, then the switch would be in the other position. And then the two connectors coming out of the switch body would, would actually be electrically connected, like a, a short circuit between them. Um, it's called a single pole because there's just the one arm here, or pole. And it's a single throw because it actually has only one active position. There's also what's, what's known as a single pole double throw. So there's one pole, but two electrically active positions. So this would have three connectors coming out, come on, out of the switch. <coughs> and actually in, in your electrical wiring, the single pole, single throw switch is the switch that controls the lights. You know, if you've got one switch in a room, like a bedroom is typ uh, typical, where you only have one light switch in the bedroom. The single pole, single throw switch in, in electrical wiring is also called a three-way switch. And the three-way switch is where, like at the top and bottom of a stairwell, okay, you would have, those are three-way switches or single pole double throw switches. I'm not gonna get into how they're, how they're wired to do the thing that they do, uh, to do what they do, but uh, that's, that's where they're used. Um, you could have single pole, triple throw and go on and, and, and on and on, but double pole, this is the last one I'll draw. Single throw. This is for actually switching maybe two circuits at the same time. So this would be something like, like this. Okay. And usually there, there may be a dashed line on the schematic indicating that these two switches are mechanically tied together somehow. So as, I, as I've shown it, both switches are in the on position. This would all be in one switch body. As I've shown it, both are in the on position and the other, there would be one toggle or push button controlling these and the other position, both of them are off. So they're either both on or both off. Um, and there are others. Okay, other again, double pole, double throw, an extension of this, just repeat that. They can also be normally classified as normally open, some called NO, or normally closed. And this terminology is often used with regard to push button switches. So for like a push button switch, another way, and this is another way to, to really draw a you know, single pole, single throw switch. This would be a normally open push button to indicate that when the button is not pressed, it's an off or open connection between the two electrical term terminals. And you guys have seen <coughs> push buttons. They're typically on printed circuit boards and we'll be using in your kit, I think you've got three or four push buttons. So if you got your kit, you can take a look at it. There should be two electrical connectors coming out of that. 
and then this little push button. Now I'm not sure whether they're normally open or not normally closed. You can easily test that with an ohmmeter, right? Connect your ohmmeter across the two leads. If it reads infinite resistance without you pressing the button, it's a normally open push button. If it reads a short circuit, then it's a normally closed push button. This would be like a normally closed. You can you can buy. So when you're, you might want to actually Google switches and see what kind of different switches you can buy and how they're classified. And of course, when you're going to buy one, um, you know it's important to know what type you're looking for or what type you have. Now, often, as you'll see, you know, as we connect these to our microcontrollers, it doesn't really matter whether it's normally open or normally closed, because you can write your software to handle either case. But you have to know, okay, as the programmer writing the software, you have to know what type of switch is actually connected to your input pin on your microcontroller. Um, so some different specifications you might see on, on a switch. It's like in the on position, Typically for a switch, we assume it's a short circuit or has a zero ohm resistance, but that's never true. You know, even electrical wire has some resistance. So, but the resistance of a switch is typically small, you know, less than an ohm. The other thing that you've got to be aware of is that switches have a current rating. A current is flowing through the switch when the switch is on, but if you um, if you try to force too much current through the switch, the switch can burn off. Okay. So there is a maximum current that you want to pass through the switch. Now in the off position, you know the the, the resistance is very high. You know we typically in circuits model it as as an uh, infinity, but it, it's not actually infinite. So with enough voltage across the switch, you can get you know, arcing to occur, and then so current will flow. Now in the off position, there may, uh, may be a, a voltage rating, 80 volts or something. And this would be the maximum voltage you can have across the switch when it's in the off position before you know the switch breaks down. Okay, or again. So it's okay to have any, any current less than 0.4 amps when it's on and any voltage less than 80 volts when it's off. Of course, when it's on, the voltage across it is essentially zero. It's going to be whatever the current is times the actual resistance of the switch. But even here at, at its maximum current with this resistance, what is that? That's going to be 0.04 volts across it. Right. So typically we assume that in the on position, the, the voltage across the switch is, is zero. It acts like a short circuit. And then in the off position, you know, it's an open. We often pretend it can have any voltage across it, but that's not really true. If you exceed the rating, you can you can damage the, the switch. Um, so there are a couple different ways that you can connect the switch. So here's here's one way. So here's your microcontroller. Let's say this is 3.3 volts. So this is probably now with this connection. When the switch is open, as I've drawn it there, what logic level, or even better, what voltage are we going to see right here at the input to our microcontroller? Yeah, zero. Okay, it's connected to ground through the, through the resistor. When the switch is closed, what Voltage are we going to see? 3.3 volts. Okay, now you can't have a, you don't want a short here. Okay, a short would be okay when the switch is open, right? We'd have zero. 
But when the switch is closed, we have a short directly to ground. And that's going to cause problems. Okay, that's going to trip a breaker, or blow a fuse on our power supply. So that's the, that's the purpose of this of this resistor is to limit the amount of current. And actually, when that switch is which switch is closed, in this case, we have like a 0.33 milliamps flowing through the resistance. Okay, but you can't have a short there. Okay. The other, you know, what students typically want to do is kind of save the resistor. Say, well, can I do it this way? And use the switch like this. Sure enough, as soon as I put something on the board, some student actually wires it up that way and then says, well, you had it on the board that way. So make sure you put an X through that and a big no in your notes. That's the wrong way to do this. Okay, when the switch is closed, we get 3.3 volts. But when the switch is open, the connection is floating. There's no voltage applied to it, but it may take a long while for the voltage here to actually change to zero, as opposed to over here. When we open the switch, any voltage here is going to actually be um, converted to zero pretty quickly because of, because of uh, the current path to the resistor. Okay, so this is the right way. Okay. So that we get a, a logic one when I'm going to say asserted. When the switch is moved to the on position or you know when a push button which is which is normally open which is normally open when it's pushed in the asserted position this would give us a logic one at the end put to the microcontroller. As we start programming the microcontroller, we'll see that we can read these. This is, will be connected to a particular pin on our microcontroller. We'll be able to read that input pin value and know that the switch has changed state and then do something because of that. Turn on a light, turn on a motor, whatever. The, other way to wire this up, uh, logic zero when asserted. In the, in the book, I think it calls this positive logic and this negative logic. Um, Again, we, we never want to make, uh, we never want to leave the input to the microcontroller just floating. When the switch is open here, you can essentially assume that the input to the microcontroller actually has a very high resistance. Um, you know, it's on the order of mega ohms, so there would be no current flow through this 10K resistor. So, in this, with the switch open, we've got 3.3 volts there. With the switch closed or asserted, then we've got zero volts there because of the short circuit. Now, actually, with the with the switch closed, there is current flowing through the 10K resistor in that case. It'd be the 3.3 across the 10K. So again, this this is the right way to do it. And then this would be the incorrect way. Wire it directly to ground. Because here it's going from zero to float, but we're probably not never going to read a high when we open the switch. Right? And it's, we're probably always going to read zero here, regardless of the state of the switch. Up here, you know, we'll read 3.3. We open the switch. Sometime later, sometime later, we probably will read zero volts, but it's an undetermined amount of time. Okay, so again, this this is a no. Don't do it this way. You don't you don't want those input connectors to to your microcontroller to ever be in some sort of disconnected state. They can e they should either be connected to the power supply or or to ground. Um, 
again, you can probably wire it up either one of these ways, you know, whatever is most convenient, and you know, take the corresponding action in software. Okay. You know, here with the switch closed, we're going to read a one. So in your in your software statement, you would say, if this port pen is one, do this. <laughs> Now here, when the switch is closed, we're, we're going to read a zero. If you want to do the same thing when the switch is asserted, here the software would be, if this port pen is zero, do the same thing. Okay. So it, it doesn't really matter which of these configurations that you use, but certainly it matters to who's ever writing your code. You know, if you, when the push button is asserted, if you want to turn on a light, you need to know that here you're going to read a one on that pen. Here you're going to read a zero when that push button, when that push button is asserted. Okay, so you can do things. This is the constant battle between you know hardware designers and, and software people. You know, it's like, well, fix it in hardware. You now fix it in software. Or if there's a bug, you know, well, the bug is in your hardware. You know, I was supposed to get a zero here. Um, according to the software engineer and the hardware engineer says, no, when the push button is asserted, I told you I was going to give you a one, so go fix your software. So, um, another issue that we'll see is, and you're probably never aware of this, but, um, you know, if you look at the waveform, when, when a switch actually goes from one position to another, you know, you get this high voltage, but then you get what ha what's known as switch balance. That, you know, it's just like dropping any sort of object, in this case, you know, a metal bar making a connection. There are microscopic bounces when that thing closes. And so you may not, this happens so quickly, I'm talking microseconds here, before, you know, it settles down into position. And the same can be true when we go from high to low. That's, that's called switch balance. There are hardware fixes to this problem. Balance. You can see how this might be an issue, you know, if, if the switch changes and we want to turn on a motor, you know, we don't want to turn it on and off and on and off and on and off. That's not good for the motor. So, you, there are hardware fixes. You can often add maybe a capacitor to the input so that you don't get that, those rapid voltage changes. Um, there are ways to actually do it with uh, devices that have uh, uh, hysteresis, uh, cement trigger devices that can provide a fix. Um, what's becoming more common is to actually fix this in software that after the initial switch, here, you detect that, and then you may wait a millisecond and read the switch again uh, to determine what actual state it's in. Okay. After a millisecond, you can assume maybe everything has settled down. Okay. Again, a lot of things we'll look at can either be fixed in hardware or software, but that is one issue that you need to be aware of when working with any of these toggle switches or push button switches that this switch bounce can, uh, can occur and is, is an issue. So any questions about switches? Pretty simple stuff, right? Okay. One to LEDs. Um, so here's the schematic symbol for an LED. Anode, typically use cathode for, uh, a K for cathode. And define the voltage and current. And so often on these things, you may see something like this to indicate light coming out, that they're light emitting, you know, little arrows or something like that to indicate that these are light emitting diodes as opposed to regular diodes. But they, light emitting diodes act like the small signal diodes that you use to electronics, you know, they uh, only allow current to flow in essentially one direction. Um, they are a little differently different that typically the forward voltage drop across a light emitting diode 
is on the, on the order of a couple of volts, you know, maybe two volts, 2.3 volts, as opposed to a regular diode, the forward voltage drop when it's conducting is about 0 0.6, 0 0.7 volts, right? So, uh, you know, physically, well, diodes come in all different shapes and forms, but, you know, this is a common discrete diode, um, often in that little, uh, do I have any laying around here? Uh, the, the cathode is typically the shorter wire. Often, if you look closely on the diode, if you look at the, the ring around the diode, the ring actually has a flat side. That's, that's the cathode. That's the indication that it's the cathode connect terminal as well. You have to know that when you wire the thing up. Unlike the resistor, you know, if, you, if you wire this thing backwards, it's just not going to work. Now, so, <clears throat> you know, the, cold, the current voltage curve for a light emitting diode uh, typically looks something like this. This may be on the order of 1.6 volts, 2, 2.4, 20 milliamps. 40 milliamps. And 20 milliamps to a, a light emitting diode is a kind of a typical current value. But the brightness of the LED actually depends on how much current is flowing through it. But the more current, the brighter the LED. You have to be careful though, there is, there is a maximum current rating. If you try to pass through, force too much current through the LED, you're going to burn it up just like you would a, a regular LED. So, and nowadays you can, you can buy low current diodes that can operate on five milliamps or less. So, but when you're connecting, so here I'm using the microcontroller. Uh, I, so on the microcontrollers, we have what are called digital IO pens. Uh, so typically the same pin can be either used as an input pin, we can read from it, or an output pin, we can write, write to it. Now you, you have to configure the pin so it's in one state or the other. It's, it's either an input pin or it's configured as an output pin. And, and the switches we're configuring it as, as an input, right? We're going to read the value of our switch. When we connect it to an LED, We've got a digital I.O. pen that's configured in its output state. And you typically have to write a binary value to a particular address to configure it as either input or output. But it, it's tempting to connect our microcontroller like this, or, or, or rather our LED to our microcontroller like this. Or perhaps like this. Microcontroller. Now, to turn the LED on, what do I need to force my output pen to in this picture? A high value or a low value? Yeah, a high value, right? I need to force current. I need to, uh, output, output on both of these. In this picture, I want to force it low to zero. So again, I've got you know, lower voltage here. Then when I force this up to 3.3, then there's no voltage drop and the LED would, would turn off. Here, you know, in the zero state, again, there's no voltage applied. There's no voltage drop here. They're both, both at zero. And the LED would turn off. I switch it to 3.3 and it turns on. Here, it's just the opposite. So again, you, you kind of have like the, uh, here you, you say, 
you would say the microcontroller is sourcing current. It's producing the current that flows through the LED. Here you would say the microcontroller is sinking current. The current's coming into the microcontroller from an outside power supply. Now, so, so typically, you know, the design on these things is pretty simple. Um, you know, assume we want a current of 20 milliamps and assume at that current, the voltage drop across the diode is two volts. Often you're not gonna know these exactly, um, you know, whether it's 1.8 or 2.2 in the on state, doesn't really matter. You'll probably get enough, you'll get enough current flowing to it that you'll see the LED turn on. And these are kind of good starting values. The voltage drop depends a little bit actually on how the, how the diode is constructed, whether it's a yellow diode or a red diode or green diode, they all kind of have different, slightly different forward, forward voltage drops. So the calculations here would be, you know, if I've got, uh, I'll call this VC for V controller, and our microcontroller, and this is fairly typical these days, our microcontroller will produce a 3.3 volt logic, 3 point volt level in its logic high state and essentially zero in its, in its logic low state. Older microcontrollers used, used to go between zero and five volts. More recently, they've gone to zero, zero to 3.3 volts. That actually means they operate, they use less power, so we get a lot more transistors in there. Um, and, and absorb less power. So we assume this is 3.3 volts. Then if I've got a two volt drop here, the pur purpose of that resistor is actually to determine the current. It's a, the current limiting resistor. So um, I would be 3.3 here, <coughs> a two volt drop there, 3.3 volts minus two, so this is the voltage across the resistor. Going just backwards, R divided by, that's the current I want. I'm trying to find the resistance value that would give me that current. So 3.3 minus 2.0. Okay. It's just a KVL loop around there. And let's see if I did this math correctly. This is 65 ohms. Now you wouldn't use a 65 ohm resistor. You'd use a standard value of resistance, which the closest standard value of resistance here is about 68 ohms. So you'd use a 68 ohm resistor. The current's going to be a little less than 20 milliamps, but you usually don't really care. The LED is going to going to turn on, and and actually the same would be true here if the output is zero. You know, you use the same value of resistance, three point three minus two. The voltage across the resistor would be that that same one point three volts for twenty milliamps. You know, you'd end up with the same resistance there, sixty eight ohms. Okay. Now now the issue here is that here the microcontroller is sourcing twenty milliamps. Here is sinking 20 milliamps. Most modern microcontrollers, microprocessors can't produce that much current. They've got limits on how much current they can source or sink. And often it may be something on the order of five milliamps. So that's the reason you can't directly connect a diode and that requires 20 milliamps to most of your microcontrollers. Um, again, there are low current diodes that um, um, you know, only require like a milliamp. Those you can connect directly to your microcontrollers. Again, dual resistor, you don't ever want to connect them directly because you have no controller over how much current is flowing. 
But typically, you can't hook these LEDs directly up to your microcontroller like that. A lot of microcontrollers, when you look at the specifications on the microcontroller, and we'll dig into this, they can often sink a lot more current than they can source. So you'll see a lot of microcontrollers hooked up like this because they may be able to success, successfully sink 20 milliamps of current, but they can't source 20 milliamps of current. This 20 milliamps is coming ultimately from your power supply that you're connected to, and then so all that current is flowing through the microcontroller. The other issue is the total amount of current your microcontroller is sourcing or sinking, because you know, you're not gonna have just this one LED connected to it. You may have several LEDs or several other devices that are all connected to it. So the total amount of current you're sourcing is an issue. So you have to always be aware of these, you know, when, when you start working with practical, practical devices, they don't act like these, they're ideal components that we talk about in, in your circuits classes. Now, switches actually do have some resistance, right? When they're on, they do have, they can't pass an infinite amount of current. You know, they, they burn up at some point. And you, you see this when you start looking at the data sheets for all these devices, they'll tell you, this is the maximum current you can safely pass through this device. I think the microcontroller that we're using, um, you know, uh, the current limit on any one, one uh, pin is like five milliamps. So again, you, you couldn't hook um, up a, a red LED that requires 20 milliamps in either one of these configurations. I don't think it can, I don't think it can sink 20 milliamps, but I'd have to look at the data sheet to be sure. So what do we do? You, you use an LED driver. And We'll work through a problem in just a bit where, where we use um, an integrated, there are packaged LED drivers that you can get just on an integrated circuit that you could use. Here we're gonna use uh, just a, a simple transistor. And good news, we're, we're going to be switching our transistor from the off state to saturation, okay? We're not gonna be uh, operating, we're using it as a switch. So we switch it from off to saturation, or essentially off to on, um, and that's the connection between the collector and emitter. Um, EC, E, this would be IC, and then and this would be the base current. And we know the base current is a lot less than the collector current, right? For, for a transistor, you know, so if we want 20 milliamps to our light emitting diode here, our base currents can be a lot less than 20 milliamps. Okay. The 20 milliamps for our, our diode now is coming from this uh, external supply, it's not being supplied by our microcontroller. Our microcontroller only has to supply the base current. So this would be a safe configuration. We have to do the calculations though to figure out these, these resistances. Um, so, but in saturation, what we know is the collector to emitter voltage is approximately a tenth of a volt. A tenth of a volt, two tenths of a volt, but it's essentially, you know, a closed switch there. It's not quite a closed switch. Usually with a, with a switch, we'd actually have a smaller voltage than that. <clears throat> um, of course, the base emitter voltage uh, depends on which electronics text you use. We'll see either 0.6 volts or 0.7 volts. Um, often 0.7 volts in saturation, maybe I don't know, I don't remember what your textbook says in electronics. The base emitter voltage, 0.6, 0.7. 
0.7. Usually in saturation, it is a little higher than in uh, active mode because the currents are higher, the voltage is a little higher. So that's, that's probably a safe value. The other thing that's true in saturation is in the in the linear mode of operation or active mode, you know, the base current is equal to IC divided by beta, right? You've got that relationship where the collector current is beta times IB. Beta is typically 100, maybe 200, you know, it varies a lot from transistor to transistor. But in, in saturation, You don't have that direct linear relationship between the base current and collector current. All you know is that the collector current is great, or the base current is greater than the collector current divided by beta. And that's how you drive it into saturation. So we can use this information to calculate our resistance values. So let's say for IC. <clears throat> equal to 20 milliamps. I'll do the full, you know, loop here. So we got 3.3 volts from here to ground, and that, that could be a 3.3 volt, you know, battery that I could draw in parallel here. But that 3.3 volts is equal to IC. R2 plus my, my diode drop okay, when this thing is on, which is, which is two volts, plus my collector to emitter voltage, which is, I'm assuming is, is 0.1 volt. So R2 is going to be 3.3 minus 2 minus 0.1 over IC or 3.3 minus 2 minus 0.1 divided by if I wanted 20 milliamps. Uh, I think this turns out to be 60 ohms. And the nearest standard value is actually 56 ohms. And that's probably what you use. A 56 ohm resistor to get that much current to go. So th this is the design. You know, how, how do we hook this thing up to get a desired amount of current to the, to the LED? Um, if we actually with R2 equal 56, but actually it's a smaller resistance. The actual IC value will be a little larger. And you, you probably wouldn't have to figure that out. You could just, we could just proceed with sending IC is 20 milliamps, but it's gonna be a little larger if I use a smaller resistance, 21.4 milliamps. So that's got my collector resistance. The other resistance I need to calculate is R1, that, that base resistor. Again, this thing is going to turn on when I've got 3.3 volts here. I've got a 0.6 volt drop, you know, 0.7 volt drop here from base to emitter. So I know the voltage drop across that resistor. It's going to be the 3.3 minus 0.7. I need to figure out, you know, what base current I want. Now, if I were in the linear mode of operation, the base current would be 100 times smaller than this. Let's, let's say beta is 100, right? In which case, the base current would be 0.21 milliamps. So kind of a rule of thumb is, and I'm not in the linear mode, I want to be in, I want to be in saturation. I'm going to let IB be IC divided by 10. That's certainly a lot larger than IC divided by 100. As a matter of fact, it's, it's 10 times larger. So let IB equal IC divided by 10. 
And again, you could probably use 20 here. That would actually give you a smaller value of base current. You know, it's a rule of thumb, right? Um, a smaller base current would actually be better because this is the current that's being sourced by the microcontrollers. The kind of a rule of thumb I've used in the past is just let this be, you know, the ratio of these two be 10. As long as you know, this is much greater than IC over beta, whatever beta is, and that's the problem, right? You don't really know what beta is unless you measure it. There's a lot of variation in beta from transistor to transistor. Um, but this is kind of a safe rule of thumb to force it to be into to force it into saturation. So in this case, IB would be 2.14 milliamps. And then now I can calculate R1. It's going to be 3.3 minus 0.7 over 2.14 milliamps. So does someone have a calculator handy? I don't have that calculation. Standard size. Now, here we're asking our microcontroller to supply two milliamps, which is probably, you know, as I said, I think the microcontroller we're using can supply up to five milliamps on, on any port pen. So, you know, by adding this transistor in there, we can do that. Now, the other thing in the book, he has, you know, since 7405, 7406. Often these are inverters. So instead of that transistor, these have, um, doesn't really matter which side the resistor goes on. So when you write a one to the microcontroller, you have a zero here. I think logic zero. I think the output voltage may be like half a volt on this thing. He specifies it most of the homework problems. So I'll give you a couple homework problems where you have the design problem is essentially finding this resistor given you know the output voltage of I think this is a 7405. But you just buy this thing instead of and you only have to pick the um, find the one resistance value here instead of two when using a transistor. So, but any questions? Okay, that is it for today. See a lot of you in a couple hours, I guess. And we can start the weekend. Like, stay here all weekend. Weekend not any fun anymore, I think so. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>